Coming up in this episode. Now you understand your system at home, a thermostat, a furnace, and an air conditioner. Okay, it's pretty obvious how they work. Right? So for us, our thermostat's in the brain. It responds to changes in overall core temperature. Mm -hmm. But we are not consciously sensitive to our core temperature. We are consciously aware of sweating. We're consciously uh, aware of shivering, but we don't consciously sense our core temperature. What do we sense? We sense our skin temperature because the skin temperature is the input to the thermostat. Mm. In many of the experiments that have looked at the effect of temperature on sleep, they failed to recognize the fact that the core temperature is one thing, the environment is a different thing. Welcome to the HVMN Podcast. What we do with our bodies today becomes the foundation of who we are tomorrow. This is Health via Modern Nutrition. We have Mateo from 8 Sleep and Professor Craig Keller from Stanford University. A special connection there because I was a Stanford alumni myself, so very excited to welcome both of you here. I know we had a lot of mutual friends yep. and very shared interests in human performance and the Stanford Connection. Welcome to the program. Thank you Thank for you. having us. It probably makes sense to just introduce ourselves. Why are you both here on the program today? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I have been an athlete all my life. So since when I was pretty young, so I have always been uh, obsessed with performance and recovery. So 8 Sleep is the first sleep fitness company. All that we do in our mission is to really fuel human potential through better sleep. But it's super exciting. I think one of the recurring topics on our program is that there are just a few things that every human does. So all of us have to eat or choose what to eat, when to eat, how to eat. We all need to figure out movements in, in some way, even if you don't exercise, by the fact that you're sitting, that is a movement, that's a geometry you're putting your body in. And of course, the third component that we must all do is sleep. Yeah. Um, and I think it's become a popular, I would say relatively recently, in the last, I would say two, three years, where you have more and more media companies talking about sleep trackers, you know, I'm wearing a sleep tracking ring right now, yeah. and I think that's become yeah. a popular tool. Um, curious from, from your perspective, Professor, um, it looks like your research interest covers a gamut a very broad uh, of, range. of, yeah. of endpoints. Um, what's exciting to you about sleep, and how did you get interested into the sleep optimization world? Well, actually, I started my research career focusing on temperature and how the brain regulates body temperature. I've studied hibernating bears, <laughs> diving seals, uh, meditating yogis, <laughs> and all sorts of unusual animals uh, in order to understand how the brain regulates body temperature. And actually, during one of those experiments, <clears throat> the data didn't make any sense until I looked at the animal. And then I saw the animal was sleeping and waking and sleeping and waking. <clears throat> so that made me study sleep. <laughs> so then for many years, I've studied sleep and uh, circadian rhythms, which are very much involved in sleep. Uh, and obviously, a major issue in our society is that we don't sleep enough and it has negative consequences. And then when I found out about eight sleep, these interests of mine all of a sudden came together because here was a company that was seriously addressing the issue <clears throat> of changes in the thermal environment during sleep and the effects that it has on the body and the effects it has on improving sleep. And I thought that was fantastic. But what really, really got me interested <clears throat> was the fact that the beds are instrumented so it's possible to record people's sleep patterns and behaviors in their homes. And that is so much better than the current standard of practice, which is recording people's sleep in sleep labs with lots of wires attached to them and in a foreign environment. Right. So I, I was fascinated with, with, with what they were offering. I think that's an interesting point where when you are in a metabolic ward for tracking diet, when you are in a sleep lab for yeah. tracking sleep, it's a very contrived environment. It's like studying yeah. a lion in the zoos. I think... I'm actually curious like, how this happens in practice. So in terms of, and I think this covers into the broader trend around quantified self and tracking. I think, you know, we can talk a little bit about just broadly. I think more and more things are going to be tracked. I think that seems to be an inevitable 
approach. We're going to just be instrumented. But I'm curious in terms of the data that you can collect on the mattress. How does that compare with a sleep lab? I imagine you know you've done at least some perhaps informal research comparing to sleep trackers like a ring or the wrist devices. Curious in terms of the product, how that sits in the ecosystem of products out there that exist. Yeah, and yeah. then from a science perspective, how does it compare to standard practice, gold standard of how do you actually measure these things? Because I think the devil's advocate perspective is that, hey, these things are all pretty inaccurate or some of these things are inaccurate. You know, what is actually you yeah. know, real data? Yeah. So yeah. two part question here. We are running a bunch of um, clinical studies. So we are working with Mount Sinai on two studies to really compare our accuracy to their polysomnographs. So they are using our device um, in, in their hospital. Um, we already completed one study. We are working on the second one. And these are really relevant for us for two reasons. On one side, we can collect truth data that then we use to train our algos. And second, it also gives us a ballpark of where we really are. So we don't really compare ourselves to wearables or regular trackers. We are really setting the bar as high as possible, which are medical grade devices. Okay. The key difference, right, between uh, being in a sleep clinic and being at home is there are a lot of variables. If, if we are in the sleep clinic, our accuracy in a lot of variables is very, very close to the one of a polysomnograph because there is an individual who is sleeping alone there with a lot of sensors so he cannot really move. Yep. There is no partner. And so the, the conditions are so good that our accuracy is insanely good. Right. When you go home, then it, it's different because some people have kids, some people have a dog, so most of our customers have a partner. And so um, it's very challenging for our engineers to create algos that can carve out all these uh, circumstances. But at the end of the day, it's just a matter of data. So if we look where we were two years ago, where we are now, we are probably two, three X more right. accurate. So it's some sort of machine learning algorithm, data cleaning to benchmark gold standard data against a polysomnograph. Exactly. And I think our listeners would love to understand, yeah, what is in the sleep lab? You know, like, okay, we, we have this notion of polysomnograph. I think people, our listeners have, we've talked about HRV as a, you know, an interesting bio, like a marker for different levels of sleep. People have talked about resting heart rate. I think temperature, obviously, from your research seems to be an important variable. Um, in the perfect sleep lab or in your research, what does that look like? What are all the inputs? What are all the output sensors? Can you just describe to us the, the, the sort of the, the standard kit? And then I guess in terms of what is the most important measures from there? How does maybe 8sleep you know, incorporate all of that? Well, I think we have to be careful that we don't put too much emphasis on a gold standard, which is clinical. Because, as we just said, it is a very foreign environment. Uh, our sleep uh, clinic, our sleep labs at Stanford, they're meant to be extremely comfortable. Uh, they don't look like a hospital room. They look like a bedroom. Uh, they have music and so forth. But still, it is not your home. It is not your own bed. It does not have all of the conditions that you normally have when you are sleeping. Yeah. Now, that is why wearables and what's also called nearables, <laughs> something close to the bed, uh, have, risen, have arisen so much interest. Now, there's no doubt that the kinds of derivatives that you get from wearables and nearables are not going to be the same as the polysomnograph. They're not going to be the same, but they're getting closer. And there's a lot of variability between them. Uh, the Sleep Research Society is just publishing now uh, the results of a consensus conference on wearables. And there are problems because this is a new field. The problems is how do you compare them? How do you standardize them? I mean, there is a problem in claiming too much. Like from accelerometers, you really cannot get an accurate measure of REM sleep. Hmm. You cannot. But you can get a lot of characteristics of sleep from these devices, and that is extremely valuable. And not only can you get all of these new measures, but you can get them from thousands and thousands and thousands of individuals. So it gives you an opportunity to really look at what is common between individuals in sleep, what is unusual, what is beyond one standard deviation of, of, of the population and so forth. 
So it's a new field. It has a lot of promise. And I think being able to uh, calibrate the wearables now with wearable EEG measures, so a band which has a few electrodes, that will be able to get you closer to seeing how the various measures that we're making with wearables and nearables, how they match to the polysomnograph. But I don't think the aim should be absolutely replicating what you get from the polysomnograph. You have to understand what you're measuring and what it's telling you. Right. And I think just to clarify for the listeners and audience, what exactly is a polysomnograph for those who aren't familiar? Polysomnogram is recording of the voltage differences between electrodes. So typically, you put an array of electrodes uh, on the scalp, and then the recording gives you the voltage differences between any two electrodes. So you can dial in whichever two you want to see. Now, what is that showing? What is creating those voltage differences? Your brain consists of billions of neurons. And those neurons generate electrical signals. If you put an electrode in one of those neurons, you get what's called an action potential. It's a nerve impulse. That's not what the polysomnograph measures. So think of going into an auditorium when there is going to be, let's say, a performance of Gregorian chants. <laughs> and you walk into the auditorium and there are hundreds and hundreds of people all talking about different things to each other. Yep. What do you hear? You hear white noise, okay? So when you are awake, your brain is doing hundreds and thousands of things simultaneously. Different parts of the brain are doing different things. So if you're listening in through these electrodes, you're hearing just white noise, okay? Now, when you go to sleep, Parts of the brain are synchronized in their activities. They're firing, the neurons are firing at the same time. And this creates big slow waves in the EEG. What those slow waves are, are very coordinated changes in electric potentials between any two parts of the brain. So back to our auditorium. You know, all of a sudden the, uh, the performers come on stage and they start this very, very uh, regular a Gregorian chant or whatever the performance is, then you hear a pattern. So what the EEG is showing you is showing you the pattern of neural activity. And those patterns change with sleep state. Got it. So this is not measuring single neuron action. No. This is clusters of neurons firing together. Big groups of neurons. Right. And I think no one really knows how they're coordinating per se, but it seems to be a pattern that you're now detecting when you're sleeping as a signal for. Right. It tells you the brain is in a different state. Yep. And uh, we talk about non-REM sleep, which is also called slow wave sleep, when you have the big, high, slow waves in the EEG. And then we have REM sleep, where the EEG looks more like wakefulness yep. because the cortex, the surface of the brain, is activated. And that's when we have the most vivid dreams. Yes, I think that is a perfect segue into just defining or even optimizing for it, right? Because I think, you know, in their conversations with athletes or sports physiologists, they oftentimes talk about you want to get into deep sleep or REM sleep. And there's, a, there's, there's multiple stages of sleep. There's light sleep. Can we help just define what are the categories? What are the attributes associated with it? And when people say, I want to optimize sleep, what do they typically mean? Well, there are several characteristics of sleep that we want to optimize. One is the duration, get enough sleep. And another is the continuity, uh, fragmented sleep with lots of awakenings. For example, an individual that has sleep apnea, periodic, periodically stopping breathing, they may actually literally wake up 200, 300 times a night. They don't know it because these are very short arousals but yet it's enough to totally fragment sleep. So these individuals come into the sleep clinic not because they can't sleep. They don't. They think they're sleeping fine. They come in because they're sleepy during the daytime. They're complaining about daytime sleepiness, okay? And it's all because their sleep has, the quality of their sleep has not been good. So 
we want to optimize the quantity of sleep and we want to optimize optimize the quality of sleep. I don't know if this is a vanity metric or some <laughs> ego, you know, I'm a, I'm a better sleeper than you, but people start quantifying, I have more REM sleep or I'm, I have like really big deep sleep. Is that just not accurate? Is that just, you know, vanity metrics, pseudoscience, you know, how, how do you think about All when people- All of the above. Okay. All of the above. Okay, so what's wrong with that kind of thinking or that kind of approach? Well, there is a regular pattern to sleep. When you go to sleep, you then go into light sleep and you go into deeper and deeper stages of non-REM sleep. So now we describe three stages of non-REM sleep. So it's stage three, which is the deepest with the big slow waves in the EEG, okay? Now, after you've been in your first episode of sleep for the night, uh, then you transition into REM sleep, okay? So the way this the way this plays out across the night is in a number of approximately 90 minute cycles. Okay? Early in the night, you have a long non-REM sleep with the deepest, deepest non-REM, and then you have a short REM episode. Then you go back into non-REM sleep. You also have some deep non-REM sleep. And then after about 30 or 40 minutes, you come back up into, or no longer than that, uh, an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, you come back up into your second episode of REM, which is now longer. And then in the third cycle, the depth of the non-REM sleep is less, it's not as long, and the REM episode is longer. So throughout the night, you undergo these oscillations between non-REM and REM, non-REM and REM. You have more REM sleep later in the night, and you have deeper non-REM sleep early in the night. So this Regular oscillation is called the, uh, these are called sleep cycles. Right. Okay? And uh, when it's all plotted out, it's called a hypnogram, <laughs> a graphic representation of your sleep. And that's what you get if you've been through a clinical study. You would get a hypnogram that shows uh, what your pattern of sleep is. So when people that are using a wearable and they're saying, okay, I'm getting like three hours more of deep sleep, is that noise in their wearable, what, what are they detecting there? Or is it just garbage? It's not garbage. Okay. Uh, you know, if you can measure something, you have to understand what you're measuring and how it relates to the conditions, okay? So any measurement is not necessarily garbage. Okay? If the measurement is made well and it's made accurately, you just have to understand what it's telling you. So one of the easiest things to measure are movements. And uh, definitely movements will tell you if you have disrupted sleep. I see. So you're not saying it's not necessarily garbage per se, but it's just it needs, it's one component amongst a number of variables that you should look at holistically. Right. right. Okay. Yep. Got it. Yeah. No, it's, it's, ex and it's extremely interesting. I think it was interesting that you said that there's not really like a quote unquote gold standard. There is a gold standard of how academics reason about sleep today right. or measure sleep, right. but that is not necessarily what a distributed smart bed should look like in the right. future. That doesn't need to be, the, it is another set of standards that you would want to optimize for. Let me just give you one more way of thinking about the gold standard, okay? Until maybe 10, 12 years ago, this, the general opinion was only mammals and birds sleep. <laughs> and why? because mammals and birds have a neocortex, that part of the brain that is generating these electrical signals that we use to create the gold standard, okay? okay. And then it became, it became obvious that lots of other animals have periods of inactivity during the day. And if you look at the animal, let's say it's a fruit fly, or let's say it's a cockroach, or let's say it's a fish, you see certain regular patterns in activity, changes in posture, decreased or, or increased arousal thresholds, okay? So in many ways, it looks just like sleep because mammals and birds also show those characteristics. But the drosophila, the cockroach, the fish, they do not have a neocortex. Huh. Their brains are built differently. So you can't expect to make the same measures, but it doesn't mean that 
that's not sleep. And now we readily accept the uh, the description of sleep states in Drosophila, sleep states in 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 other insects, sleep states in invertebrates, sleep states in um, in in you know amphibians and reptiles and so forth. Fascinating. Okay, so so even the definition of sleep, if you're looking from just a very high biological level, is the, the way to measure it is not even universal if you look at all types of different animals, yeah. which is interesting when I think about it. I just wonder now, you could probably define some sleeping pattern for even, you know, plants, for example, right? Like there's there's different cycles and circadian rhythms. Well, certainly there are circadian rhythms in plants. Right. <laughs> so what sensors did you find valuable from a practical mattress perspective? What met the you know, your personal gold standard as you're building out the product sure. and the vision of what you wanted to build here? We started with piezo sensors. Um, so they are like microfilms that are inside the bed. Mm -hmm. um, they have been uh, used in hospitals or in health grade uh, environments for quite a long time before I ate sleep, right? Um, and they work like a stethoscope. So when you're sleeping on a pod, you're substantially sleeping on a stethoscope. And um, these sensors are usually really good at tracking your heart rate and your respiration and your movement. These are the three factors our algos use to then infer sleep. Because again, the best way uh, in, a, in a lab to track your sleep would be with an EEG, as Craig was saying, so to track your brain waves. Yeah. Um, obviously, we know through previous experiences that people don't want to wear a, a headband. And so what was the closest thing to get to that level of accuracy without wearing anything? That was piezo sensors. Yeah. But since when we started the company to today, obviously sensors keep evolving and actually they even accelerated. And the beauty of the bed is we have a lot of space. And for us, adding a 10 bucks sensor in our bomb doesn't make any difference, right? In our cost of manufacturing, uh, the pod goes out for 2300, 2400. So 10 bucks, more or less, it doesn't really change our unit economics. And so you will see in the future with when, when, when we look at the roadmap of our products that if now we have one sensor, maybe tomorrow we have two, but then maybe tomorrow we also have other three, four sensors for presence, for temperature, for light and noise, because they don't have a, a real impact. Right. Then the future is, can, can we in X years from now, be able to track brain waves uh, uh, with the, uh, w without you wearing anything. Right. That is where we want to go, and there is where you can achieve certain degrees of accuracy. Right. The last thing that I think is really important is because you don't wear anything, and the average person keeps the bed for six to eight years, I think one of the things that excited professors like Craig is uh, our retention. So maybe you don't have sleep apnea today, but maybe you have it in a year and a half, and very likely you are still using our product, right? Maybe you don't have arrhythmia today, but you have in, a, in two years from now. Yep. And also seeing these sleep patterns, what professors always say is, fine, you go to the sleep lab, we track you for one night, two nights, but then that's it. If we don't catch something during those two nights, mm -hmm. we don't know anything about you. Well, instead, in our case, now we start having customers that have been with us for two, three years. And so this continuity in the pattern of their sleep, it's something that I think is really new for the industry and is what excites uh, people like Craig. Yeah, absolutely. Very important. Very important. Yeah, I mean, I think that's like the big question with almost any human study. How, what's the longitudinal data, right? Because you just... We're not animals that can get locked in a cage for, yeah. you know, more than like, it, it, I think the longest metabolic ward study is just like, you know, 28 days or something, right? It's just hard to get people in the room for that long. The reverse situation is also true. If you have been in the hospital, if you have had a problem and you're released to home, the quality of your sleep might be the best measure for your recovery. Mm -hmm. So providing valuable information as to how you are you know, improving after you've had a particular right. surgery or or treatment or, or whatever. Yeah. I, th I think the key difference between us and a lot of wearables is for us, tracking your data is just step one to then really improve sleep. What we care is improving sleep. Customer keeps saying, oh, I love all this data, but so what? That's why we got into the pod, right? And temperature control. So 
we are completely fine to coexist with other wearables. Yeah. More data is better for everyone. Yeah. Um, we obviously we have an integration with Apple Health Kit, so we can already see data like your fitness activity, your steps activity, yeah. and then for the night we have our own. Because of the form factor of the sensors, we feel very confident about heart rate, HRV, respiration, movement, and presence in bed. The key thing for us is to keep developing the algos to really interconnect these three factors to determine the sleep stages. I have a colleague at Stanford who is very much focused on getting as much data continuously as possible. So he wears probably 10 or 12 uh, wearables all the time. Yeah. And his expertise is being able to analyze the results as big data. And he actually discovered his own diabetes before it was obvious clinically. Fascinating. How, how, in, in what way? Well, you frequently, if, if you look at an, a variable, as Matteo just said, uh, it, it's going to change from hour to hour, from day to day. Yep. So if you just have a clinical measure once, like you go to the doctor, he takes your pulse and, and uh, that's the measurement. Yep. Okay. But if you record that pulse continuously, if you record the blood sugar continuously, yeah. so you know, is it spiking? Is it not spiking? Is it responding so the way it's CGM respond? and then he... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, the more data, the more likely it is you're going to be able to describe not only the condition of the individual, but have more information to guide how you're going to change things, how 100%. you're going to improve. 100%. I want to get to interventions. I think that's probably yeah. one thing that our listeners want to get to, like tips. And I know thermal regulation is a big part of it. But I do want to like, talk a little bit about that the continuous data point because there are folks from the other side. I, I think it sounds like all of us are pretty much on the same camp in terms of kind of more data is better. But there are some cl practitioners, clinicians who say, no, this is too much information. You're going to confuse the patient. Um, my perspective there is that, look, Yes, you could confuse people, but you should give access to people for their own health data. It seems silly to me that you know the health of your car, your house history, of what has been repaired, not repaired, but yeah. you can't see the continuous data of your own right. glucose, your sleep. How, how do you reason about that? Yeah. I, it's an individual issue. I mean, there are lots of people in our society who are not going to be able to uh, integrate all of the information into their decision making. So you have to tailor it. Uh, you don't have to tell everybody everything. I, my colleague, I just mentioned, I'm sure wouldn't recommend that everybody wears 12 di different wearables. Right. Uh, what he's showing is he's showing the value in getting continuous information and getting information from different sources. That doesn't mean that everybody has to wear 12 different uh, wearables. Yeah. I'm a European, right? I grew up in Europe. And in Europe, you have access to your own data. If you go and you take a blood test, they give you the results. Right. And then you can go to your doctor. In the results, there is what are your numbers and what is the, the, the suggested for. Huh. So you immediately get 80, 20. If there is yeah. something yeah. really wrong, then they tell you and then you go to the doctor. And so when I moved here, it was so surprising to me that I go there, they, they run these tests on my body, and then I don't have the records. I don't expect to be the person who analyzes it, but the person who has this record because maybe tomorrow I want to go to a doctor. Imagine if one day I go back to Europe. Yeah. And they say, what happened to you for the past 20 years? I don't know. I can't have my data. I, I don't know. What was your blood uh, sugar level? Whatever. I'm sorry, I don't know. You did this uh, M MRI. What happened? I don't know. It's my own data. I need to own it. I might need to, for sure, I need a consultation with someone who is an expert. But I need this because I will likely need as I age in, in my life. Yeah. I agree with that. I think it's I think it's a respect on the individual. I think you have to respect that people ultimately have the most agency and responsibility of their own health in life. If you can't trust them to manage your own information, it's like are we gonna literally be nanny state for everyone? I think it, I think the answer is like at least we should empower people with information to understand versus you are not smart enough. Let us doctors or, or, or experts in this ivory tower tell you exactly what to do. And it's an educational opportunity. Yeah. People can learn. Yeah. Let me tell you a quick funny story yeah. about the importance of data. Um, a year ago, immediately after Thanksgiving, I got fever for, I don't know, the first time in three years. It was just a regular 
fever. It, it was very high. Um, so I looked at my heart rate data, heart rate at rest. My heart rate at rest started increasing three days before. Mm -hmm. So now if I see, I, I never got sick again yeah. since then, but if I start seeing two days where my heart rate at rest keeps going up, I would assume that I might be getting sick. Yeah. And this is something, uh, yeah. one of the things that we want to provide in the future now with our device. So. The, the educational part that you know you you built just by looking at uh, your data is fundamental for your future yeah. it, the delta in day by day increasing was huge yeah. so there are no doubts uh, that something weird is happening in your body so like i guess their are resting heart rate is typically is in my case is 50 something and know? then when you three days before you got sick it I went up it to was, like 60 or something i think it was higher than that wow uh, yeah which is I, I, I can recheck, but yeah. imagine somewhere between 60 and 70. Imagine there was a 20, 30 percent increase. Right. And it, it's not that it just happens overnight, but it's day one, day two. And then day three is when I got the fever and it was probably in the 70s. Right. And then while I was having fever, I was in the 90s all day. Wow. Yeah, I think that's like been a lot of the anecdotes that we've got in our community where people are measuring these things. And that is one of the coolest stories to hear. It's like you can kind of predict when you're getting sick with like heart rate or body temperature. Um, so I think we've been kind of teasing at interventions now. I think we have a good substrate around, okay, how do we measure these things? What are the stages that we want to be optimizing for, whether it's deep sleep or REM or reducing wakefulness and increasing duration? These are some reasonable targets to optimize for. What can we do practically as normal people here to optimize for these attributes of sleep? We've done a lot of work on the effects of temperature on sleep. And a lot of that work, not just ours, but in the literature, is kind of hard to understand. It's all over the place. Because there's perfect data that shows that if you do something to raise your body temperature late in the day, early evening, late evening, you have deeper slow wave sleep, okay, early in the night. Uh, there is the advice now, the dictum, that uh, it, it's much better to sleep in a cool environment. Yeah. And part of the problem in making sense of these different observations is a lack of understanding of the human thermoregulatory system. Now, you understand your system at home, a thermostat, a furnace, and an air conditioner. Okay, it's pretty obvious how they work, right? So for us, our thermostat's in the brain, in the deep in the brain, okay? So it responds to changes in overall core temperature. Mm -hmm. But we are not consciously sensitive to our core temperature. We are consciously aware of sweating. We're consciously uh, aware of shivering but we don't consciously sense our core temperature. What do we sense? We sense our skin temperature because the skin temperature is the input to the thermostat. Mm. So in many of the experiments that have looked at the effect of temperature on sleep, they failed to recognize the fact that the core temperature is one thing, the environment is a different thing. And I know we failed to recognize that or very early on. We wanted to study the effect of skin temperature on sleep. And, and we realized, you know, you can go, you can experience all sorts of different temperatures and it's not all that extreme. And we got these, these suits of tubing that the astronauts use under their space suits to keep them warm when they're going out on an extra vehicular uh, uh, gambit. But so, yeah, it is definitely true that uh, a cool environment promotes better sleep because that gives you the ability to adjust your comfort level while I you're see. So it's sleeping. less so that it's the coolness is a main driver. It's the coolness allows your body to remain, maintain homeostasis by having right. the ability to either try to stay warm or release heat. And then there's another variable, and that is the change of body temperature, because our thermostat goes through a cycle on a 24-hour basis. It's a circadian rhythm of body temperature. And in addition, when we go to sleep, our thermostat goes down. 
So we have these two factors that are normally uh, changing what we're evaluating as comfortable or not comfortable. And, and when you go through a situation such as having a warm bath in the evening and then going to bed, it's not just the absolute temperature of your core or your skin, but they're changing. Yeah. So there's a rate of change. There's a dynamic there that is, is playing a role. Yeah. So the value of this technology that eight sleep has is that you have an enormous range of variables that you can adjust to get your absolute best thermal comfort for sleep. Yeah, let's talk about that. So devil's advocate, okay. So we know that coldness or coolness is an important lever. Okay, there's air conditioning, there is like literally the thermostat in the room. There's, I guess, blankets, heavy light blankets. What does eight sleep do that's superior to some of these other more basic interventions that one could play with to control the coolness of a room? There are two things, right? So one, you need to be in a cold environment, right? A lot of our customers, they, they fight with their partner, just as simple as that, <laughs> right? So having your own zone because each side of the bed can have a different temperature is the first thing. But there are two things. First, being in contact with a surface that is cooler is very different from being uh, in an environment where the air is colder mm -hmm. just because of heat transfer, mm -hmm. right? So what you need to impact is what Craig was saying. It's not your, your skin temperature, which is the only thing that would be really impacted by the, the bedroom. You need to impact your core temperature. To fall asleep or usually as soon as you fall asleep, your core temperature drops. Um, but the other factor is, is still what Craig was saying is you don't need a fixed temperature during the night. That keeps changing based on your circadian cycle. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at your body temperature, it designs a U-curve, right? As you fall asleep, your body temperature drops and a couple of hours before you wake up, it starts rising again yeah. to wake you up. Mm -hmm. And so before eight sleep, you were sleeping on a damp bed where the temperature of the bed just goes up because it absorbs your body body heat. So the curve is just uh, straight up to the right. Right. You are in a... in a little bit, but yes, it's like directionally, monotonically right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you are in an environment that even if you have set a 68, is flat. And 68 might work for the first hour or might work for the third, but definitely will not work for the whole time. What our product does is it changes the temperature multiple times during the night to follow your circadian cycle. So we are not reinventing the wheel. We are just enhancing your body changes that would naturally occur. Awesome. So essentially, point one, a more efficient heat transfer. So obviously, it makes intuitive sense if it's contact on your skin versus just ambient dissipating through air. Sure. Much more efficient heat transfer. And then there's an interesting innovation to follow the body temperature through uh, through like the natural heat cycle. And I, I suppose, you know, are you guys doing something, you know, machine learning on top of that? Because obviously I imagine that my little body temperature weight curve is going to be different from yours and different from yours. Exactly. So you guys yeah. are trying to learn and match. Yeah. Okay. I think we all, as customers of mattress at some point in our lives, understand there's like firmness. And that's like the main variable that we all buy by you know, cloud mattress or foam mattress versus a stiff mattress. And it sounds like you guys are really bringing an innovation on the temperature dynamic. Now yeah. you can actually control this as a, as a lever to optimize yeah. your sleep. Yeah. There are also a bunch of studies that uh, scientifically prove the benefits, right? Of yeah. per cooling and thermoregulation, um, achieving deeper sleep, um, falling asleep faster. Uh, and our data on top of these two things that we are seeing, we see impact on REM, we see impact on toss and turns, and we see positive impact on uh, um, number of times you wake up during the night. So first of all, 84% of our customers using cooling report better sleep. This is a qualitative Subjective, feedback, yeah. but this comes directly from there. Yeah. So 84% is a pretty high Pretty high number. Uh, we see that people sleeping cool on the pod toss and turns 25% less based on our data. Um, we see um, increase uh, up to 17% in periods of deep sleep for people using cooling. Um, we see falling asleep faster up to 15%. And uh, we also see 14% less wake-ups in the middle of the night. 
uh, based on our data. I mean, I think that's like the citizen science part of me that's like super excited because you can run these end sizes that would be impossible yeah, to run in academia. Right. Yeah. But I, I, you know, but I do want to caveat the other side. It's like, okay, you could probably control or placebo control better in academia, but that's the trade-off, right? You can get n equals yeah. 1,000, 10,000 relatively cheaply versus, okay, you get 50 people that you control and, and randomize and do all, all, all of that. And it's like, both, I think, are valuable pieces of data. Both contribute to our understanding, right? Yeah. So, I mean, 10 to 20% increases are, is, is pretty significant. Yeah. So it's very, yeah. very cool. Very, very impactful, especially yeah. with the sample size. Yeah. Now, there are two kinds of experiments. There are controlled conditions experiments where you keep everything constant and vary one. But there are many areas of research where you have observational results. Uh, so, for example, in ecology, uh, you can't necessarily go out into nature and change w one variable, yeah. okay? So what you do is you observe large populations and you compare them, okay? And that's essentially what this enables, this technology enables us to do in looking at the relationships between temperature and sleep. Yeah. I mean, I think that's actually been one of the topics that has we've talked a lot about on this program, associational studies, such in epidemiology, mm -hmm. you know, it's... And I think this is actually a good question to like talk, to discuss with you guys among sleep in the sense that very hard to make causational claim, causative claims, or one would prefer not to make causative claims to associational data. And there's a risk for confounding factors. So maybe it's an appropriate question to ask, you know, are we measuring some sort of placebo, you know, other other confounders within the eight sleep population because they obviously care about sleep, they are more attuned to it. Um, how do you address uh, the confounders? When you start having thousands of people, different gender, different age, yeah. and you match qualitative feedback with quantitative feedback, um, obviously everything can be in life, but no, you, you start getting to a point where you start seeing patterns. Right. I mean, you can't have a controlled experiment in every area of science. Right. In some cases, you have to do observational you have to collect data nonetheless, but you look at the, you compare different sets of observational data under different conditions or different populations. So if you're seeing the same things with all these various populations, it's kind of hard to say that's a placebo effect. The epidemiology discussion is quite polarizing in the nutrition space yeah. where you know, I, I think just, you know, there's a, you know, a recent paper on how red meat is actually not as bad or red meat is bad. And if you look at it, it's like, right. who's slicing the data? What story do they want to tell? And it's like, yeah, that is true. No one's going to run a randomized controlled trial on tracking thousands yeah. of people eating a steak or not a steak. Mm -hmm. But you can make some, you know, hopefully try to tease out the patterns underlying it. And it sounds like, at least with sleep, I think I, I can get some comfort around the fact that there's likely less confounders with sleeping effectiveness versus diet because like it's so like diet is very very messy sleep is a little bit simpler so i can understand that we are a little bit more comfortable with the confounders that are there well you know on the other hand um there are so many things that affect sleep in our modern day society the fact that you're getting these consistent and highly significant results in spite of the variability of people living in the city, people working on shift work, people uh, being exposed to artificial light at all different times of the day. Uh, the fact that you are seeing similar patterns in these very different populations, that's, that's what gives you confidence. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. So thermal regulation is one lever. Mm -hmm. Are there other levers that you hope to look at in the future or things in, in the product pipeline? Um, and in terms of just opening it more broadly for the literature at large, what, you know, what do you guys do personally in addition to either temperature to optimize sleep? Right now, uh, the kinds of treatments that are recommended for insomnia are mostly cognitive behavioral therapies. So rather than take pills, rather than take um, you know, potions and what have you, um, there are lots of things you can do to improve your sleep hygiene. Have a regular time to go to sleep. Don't do critical work before your, just before your bedtime. Don't be looking at blue screens uh, when it's time to, to go to sleep. Uh, have regular wake-up times. 
Uh, so there are all sorts of things you can, and you know, regular meal times. Uh, you don't eat a big meal before you go to sleep. Uh, reasonable uh, behavior with respect to alcohol. So there are lots of things that impact sleep. Right. And a, a big focus now is sleep hygiene. How can you improve your sleep through behavioral means? Yeah, anything that you adopt personally? I mean, do you, not to put you on the spot, but how many of those do you actually follow or are you actually, you know, hitting, you know, I don't look at the phone after seven o'clock. I, I, I wish I could say that myself, but I am not as disciplined perhaps as some, some, as either of you here. I'm curious in terms of, I think those are definitely the best practices. And, and I think the question is, which ones have you actually been able to pro like actually implement in your life from blue wave glasses to special supplements to fall asleep to be very methodical with my sleep schedule uh to changing the the color of the lights uh, in in my house since when i go back at 7 or 8 p.m so i try to be uh, to follow all these practices yeah but for us as eight sleep so we want to be the place where you go to really enhance your sleep right and so there will be from any sort of product, some of the ones we discussed, we already sell blue wave glasses and all that. But to us, there is also this huge impact in the environment as you are asleep. So in the future, what you will see is how are we going to control the whole environment to maximize your sleep? Yep. For example, one thing we have, I don't know if you know it, but we have what is called a thermo alarm in, in the device. And so we use cooling to wake you up in the morning before the sound goes off. Today I flew here, I woke up at 4.30 a.m. I used my thermal alarm, I woke up five minutes before the sound went, went off. And I use it every morning because I love it. In the future, there will be other factors. In the future, we will control oxygen. Probably you have, uh, I mean, you for sure have heard about a lot of athletes sleeping in altitude tents. Yeah, hypoxic tents. Yeah. yeah. So they will be the first company, a sleep fitness company, that will bring that to mass consumers. Fascinating. And that is what we want to be. That, that would be cool, right? If you have your thermal regulation, maybe you have hyperoxygenated chamber to recover more quickly. If you want to train for altitude, maybe it turns exactly. into a hypoxic yeah. tent. An environment where there is, uh, that is soundproof. Yep. So it doesn't you know, take you out from deep sleep. Yep. Um, a wake up experience with, with lights and, and scents. Yep. So all these in three to five years is, is gonna happen. Yeah, that, that's really cool. I would say a, you know, a common topic that comes up from our audience is that EMF, electromagnetic waves, you know, if you live near a, a, a big power station or something and you might get a higher dosage of these EMF waves, is that, is that legitimate? Is that real? Is that, I mean, I can imagine if that, that science pans out, you could consider being, you know, sleeping in a Faraday cage, for example. Curious in your experience, in, in, if you looked at the literature, is there something there? Are people, you know, paranoid? Is, is there some signal? What is, what is your stance there? I'm not aware of any uh, definitive data that shows uh, effects. Obviously, if you go to extremely high, you're not going to stick your head in the microwave, right? Okay, <laughs> or you you probably shouldn't get really close to big transformer boxes right. uh, for long periods of time. But the kinds of uh, electromagnetic wave uh, exposure that we get just in our normal environments, I, I, I'm not aware of any data that shows. Uh, negative effects. Okay. Yeah, no, I think that's as my understanding as well. I think the null hypothesis is that it's I mean, there's no data suggests otherwise, but it is something that just kind of, I don't know if it's one of these like conspiracy theory things or other people just sort of at the edge, just that extra sensitive, they're just giving us a little bit of signal to like look into it, you know, it's just like, I guess, you know, if there's data to prove, show other, you know, either direction, I think that's perhaps an interesting place to look. Um, I think the oxygen environment is interesting. Anything else? There is some new data, some new studies that show uh, that you can entrain the EEG uh, to appropriate frequencies for non-REM sleep through sound. Mm. And uh, certainly uh, meditation, uh, which is a relaxation practice, can be uh, enhanced by sound. And actually, my, my nephew, who is a musician, he's just started an effort, which he calls Pineal Labs, 
to create music specifically for relaxation and meditation. And you, you could imagine creating not just a soundless environment for sleep, but a positive sound environment that would enhance uh, sleep and, and relaxation. Fascinating. I've definitely seen companies that, that, that markets, you know, different types of binaural beats or yeah. different types yeah. of generated yeah. music to induce yeah. brain yeah. states. So, so, so I'm actually curious. So, so you, I, I, it, for me, I haven't looked deeply into the literature. Yeah. So there's something there. There's, there's definitely something, something there. there. I mean, Amy, one thing that I actually had a recent conversation about was, and when you mentioned music, sparked uh, this conversation around scent. Apparently scent can trigger uh, different states within sleep as well. And, and this particular gentleman was discussing whether you can uh, use scent to prime some of the learning stages of sleep. And he was noodling around. If you have a certain scent when you're training a golf swing or a, a certain movement and you prime that when you're sleeping, could you, you know, induce more of a learning effect on that specific move? We've actually done those experiments on animals. And essentially what uh, we're able to do is to um, <clears throat> train animals, uh, let's say, to a typical Pavlovian conditioning, or uh, you, they respond to a sound, whether it's a fear or a petitive or whatever it is, <clears throat> and couple the, the experience with a particular odor. If you reintroduce that odor during sleep, you greatly enhance the memory of that particular tr uh, training. Fascinating. So the theory behind that is that in order to consolidate memories, we reactivate them during sleep. And that's not dreaming, okay? It's not dreaming. But it's a reactivation of the particular neural activity patterns that is coding the information. And this is typically happened, so not in REM, which is dream state. But not in REM, this is but deep, in non-REM. Non-REM It's non-REM that, that these reactivations of the patterns uh, are believed to be the part of the brain that's encoding the information originally, the hippocampus. This is for declarative memories, spatial memories, events, that sort of thing. And then during sleep, these memories are transferred to the cortex where long-term memories are stored. And the way this is done is by repeating the communication uh, over and over again. And the idea is that if you do something to trigger the reactivation of a particular memory, then that's the one that will be strengthened. Interesting. And one idea is that this could be used actually to enhance a therapy for PTSD. So uh, one of the therapies is extinction therapy. The person recalls the event in a safe environment. Well, the problem with that technique is that then the, the, the adaptation is specific to that environment. Right. But if instead you coupled the therapy with, let's say, a sound or a smell, and then you reintroduce that during sleep, you would be reactivating the therapy session independent of the context of the environment. So. And I think the next wave in sleep will be now that we have the data because of this awesome job that a lot of companies did, we can start triggering actions that can unlock your sleep as you are asleep or even before, because imagine a near future where you will be able to take a certain supplement before going to bed and you see how that impacts your deep sleep. Yep. At that point, you know if it works or not. Yep. So personalized sleep is the future and is, it needs the data to be achieved. Yep. No, I would agree with that point. I think I've gotten less utility out of my sleep ring just because if I like my pattern, I expect some natural variance in my data, but it's just the same data. It's no longer useful for me. And I don't think that people are constantly trying to change their sleep patterns every yeah. every every two weeks. And I think that's the, the so what. You have this data, so what? And I think that's where I think you're absolutely on the spot. I think that's like the critique of most wearables. If you just aren't motivated to actually use the data for a purpose, then it just, it just, it just like, I call it data porn. It's like, cool, like you have all this data, but no one does anything with it. Yeah. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. I think if this is really gonna be something that sticks, it needs to add value where people can actually get the improvement or benefit from it. Maybe moving on to a little bit more, you know, 
grab bag of sleep related topics. I think one of the things when people talk about sleep and optimization is the concept of lucid dreaming. Again, one of these more fuzzy, hazier topics, but there's been some speculation that if you can lucid dream different practices or skills, you might be able to learn faster. Again, not an expert in this field of sleep research. Maybe asking the professor here, is that pseudoscience? Is there something there? Well, lucid dreaming definitely is a phenomenon. Uh, and some people find it easier to do than others. And the experience can vary. So the experience is actually being aware that you are dreaming and then changing your dream. Okay. So without waking up, you're asleep, you realize you're dreaming and you change, you can manipulate it. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> that can go in a negative direction so that the dream can actually become not restful or relaxing or comfortable, but uh, like a nightmare. Like a nightmare, okay. yeah. So there are some people, I, I think, that uh, get negative effects. Other people get positive effects. What we can say now is that it's definitely a phenomenon. Whether that extends to any sort of potential for health therapies, I can't say. A little bit more speculative. Yeah. One of the common discussions around sleep is that, you know, modern humans dream less because we're either not going to REM or you're just less forgetful about this. And then I think there's some, some of the folks in the ancestral communities that talk about that dream interpretation or dream journaling is something that's important. Um, yeah, I think just thinking for myself, I don't think I, I don't, I don't recall my dreams as clearly as I think I did when I was a child. Mm. Um, I don't know if that's placebo or just, some, you know, maybe just me not being thoughtful in my sleep. There's no knowledge as far as I know that actually uh, explains a purpose of dreams. Now you come back to Freudian uh, psychiatry and so forth, but none of that I think is, is really solid. Um, the one thing that happens during REM sleep is your cortex gets reactivated. Okay, In non-REM sleep, the cortex is very inhibited. But during REM sleep, it's reactivated. Now, you are prevented from acting out your dreams by a simultaneous inhibition of all of your outputs, the motor outputs, the skeletal, the outputs, the skeletal muscles, and so forth. If in animal experiments, a particular part of the brain that is a way station for that inhibition is eliminated, animals will act out their dreams, okay? And that's obviously not a good idea. Now, I have to add that sleepwalking is not in REM sleep. Sleepwalking is in non-REM sleep, okay? And sleepwalking generally doesn't involve the extreme uh, emotions and activities that uh, characterize uh, dreams, vivid dreams. Uh, it's more an extension of normal activities. Right. Okay? But... Um, my particular personal view is that uh, dreams are an epiphenomenon of the fact that the cortex is reactivated. And there has to be a reason for that. And my own view is that while we're awake, we obviously build up a need for sleep. But in my view, we only build up a need for non-REM sleep. Mm. And then as we express non-REM sleep, we create a need for REM sleep. Hmm. So unless you discharge that need for REM, you can't get back into non-REM, okay? So it's like a, a, a yin-yang relationship between wake and non-REM and a yin-yang yin relationship between non-REM and REM. And I think that function of REM is a physiological function, not a psychological or psychiatric function. Got it. So it's more like the smoke come out of the exhaust. It's just some it, cortex firing. It's a consequence firing. of the fact that you have to reactivate periodically the cortex. Right. And in order to make that happen, you have to inhibit all the inputs and outputs. Right. Okay. So there's nothing that is shaping the dream from the real world. It's free to associate. Right. Okay. So you're not getting, I'm sure you've had the dream of having to get away from something or on a dangerous situation and you can't move. Right. 
That's because you're not getting information back from your joints and your muscles, the proprioceptive information that tells you what your limbs and muscles are doing. Right. So in the absence of that, the interpretation in the dream state is you can't move. Yeah. You're admired in concrete. You know? <laughs> Yeah, fascinating. I think one sort of grab bag topic that's popular with our with our audience is um, different supplements. You mentioned that you try to optimize through different types of food and, and whatnot. And then more on the extreme side, there's performance uh, uh, boosters, people from caffeine to modafinil, which is a narcolepsy medicine, but quite common, especially in military applications for super long flights, um, even on psychedelic psilocybin, uh, potentially improving sleep quality. Curious to get the broader opinion or, or thoughts in terms of compounds, supplements, ingestibles that can help mold different sleep. And it's something similar to nutrition. So a major change that will happen in the next years is is personalization, right? Um, what we have seen is there are certain supplements that work for some people, but maybe they don't work for others. Yeah. Some some supplements that work for two people, but they need to adjust the doses because otherwise it's too impactful on their deep sleep or their RAM, things like that. Yeah. So the key thing here is where, where I see the future going is to be really able to quantify the impact of what people try and see if it's working for them or not. Right, you can go from simple things like melatonin or magnesium, or to much more elaborated and sophisticated supplements. Yeah. I'd avoid them as much as so possible. So you're on the camp of just get good sleep and try to avoid any of this. Right. I mean, I've lived through the years of of horror stories from the benzodiazepines. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that has made me wary of of any sort of pharmacological approach. Uh, and now there are, you you mentioned the military using M, using uh, awake promoting drugs for long missions and that's true. But would I recommend people taking amphetamines uh, for improving their wakefulness if they're not sleeping well? No. I certainly wouldn't, but they are used in the military. Amphetamines are used in the military to promote wakefulness. So modafinil, caffeine, obviously, uh, every military operation has the coffee pot that's constantly running. Um, so yes, there are things that we have taken to enhance wakefulness or uh, in the, on the contrary, enhance sleep for years and years and years. But I, I think it's much a, health, a much healthier situation to be able to do without them. I think that's fair. I think with almost any intervention, there's trade-offs, yeah. right? And I think there are likely some scenarios, especially in a war fighting scenario, where a short-term boost in performance might be worth the risk. Right. But I do have you know folks that are friends in the military that are like, yeah, I don't want anything. So I don't want any of that trade-off. I don't yeah. want to be reliant on a caffeine or anything. So I think it is it goes back to sort of personalization. I think yeah. there are different risks. That's what I would think. Yeah. Yeah, for everyone is a little bit of benefits for everyone, and I, I think we all wish we could be non-dependent on anything. But if something can be a useful crutch, maybe consider it. And then over to you, Matteo. Got to ask why eight? What is the meaning of eight? So the number eight comes from the fact that we have this contrarian uh, approach to the fact that to, we believe we can disrupt the eight hours uh, okay. of sleep. Um, actually, we, we had an offsite recently with the company and I was showing them a bed from 3000 years before Christ at the time of the Egyptians. Yep. And it was looking almost the same, right? It was just a surface uh, you know, at, at, at this height from, uh, from the floor and people were lying on that. And that was 3000 years before Christ, yep. right? So 4000 years later, most of the people in the world, they are still sleeping on something that didn't really change. So we believe technology can enhance your sleep and compress that time, or in any case, let you get more out of, of that. That's why eight sleep. Yeah, so please just go to 8sleep.com to check out the, the pod. Use the discount code uh, HVMN for 150 bucks off. Yeah, no, thanks for the special offer for our listeners, I think. If you guys are interested, I think a lot of good technical and scientific rationale and data here. So super excited to see how all you guys think about the product. I need to try it out my, for myself personally, so I'll let you guys all know when I have a chance to do that. And then Craig, love to get your, your, your shout outs, your links. So I know you're on the scientific advisory board for eight, 
but you also have a day job at Stanford. That's Where right. do people track all of your work? Uh, well, I guess uh, through uh, the, st the faculty websites at Stanford, yeah. uh, there is a profile of everyone, and you can get access to references for all their published work. But if anyone's just interested in in the basics and the trivia of sleep, I did a course several years ago for the great courses, and it's called The Secrets of Sleep. So if uh, <laughs> you, you want to learn about all the esoterica of sleep, as well as some of the uh, special interest areas, such as the role of, of, uh, of uh, loss of sleep in accidents and uh, tragedies and the benefits of good sleep. Awesome. Check out that course. Well, tune in. Well, thanks so much, Craig. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mateo. Thank you so much. It was great. If you're interested to learn more about HVMN, visit www.hvmn.com pod. Thank you for tuning in. 